there has been no youth league for the last 6 years that means not we have lost one generation we have lost six generations of players some competitions they cannot play because there are no fields for children it's like uh, stones instead of uh, fields in india we can keep on finding the reasons the excuses if you will that why aren't we success we were number 79 on the world on the fifa ranking but we changed our youth development you're in india and you're asking about indian football development and you have a flag of man city on the wall at the back what is the culture of football in your country but the federation doesn't have any money they are dependent on fsdl reliance the movement what the football association is doing in uganda right now watch out and they have a president who doesn't stand for anything he's on tv every thursday night and the fans and the population of the country 40 million can phone in and hold him accountable and ask him questions over here federation is a different unit the fsdl isl at all together different unit and then comes the coach he is left alone aside to make his decision but trust me my budget compared to an isl club is 100 so imagine what these 10 or 15 billionaires who are out there can do if they really want to the investment that uh, the caribbean uh, countries make it's all towards cricket now the players are playing in saudi arabia they are moving to europe and again gambia does not have a local league but these are local players that are also going now in india you have to make five six centers and they put the best players and start keeping these players and not say ah this one not to be take another one this one and then you don't develop them for the future the guys never ever had to pull boots on and there was one player that we took we gave him boots he scored a goal for the togolese national team and uh, he's playing now for raja casablanca with that casablanca in morocco there's no guarantee who's going to be the manager of our team our club still doesn't know if we are playing in the final round or not when i was with uh, guyana national team and then west indies they somehow pulled out of the the world cup and then they started the like the ipl that they had and there was not one hotel available for the men's national team and we are playing a huge game against puerto rico and are you telling me from a billion people we cannot get 11 decent guys to compete uh, against other countries there's something not right there it's the same it's the same challenge we had in in bangladesh so before we get started with today's discussion I would like to take a moment and introduce all the amazing guests that we have today. So, starting with we have Jeremy Fishbin who is the ex director of football and academy FC Madras. We have Steve Harbords, head of football United Sports Club. We have Peter Menjatsma, under 20 national team head coach of Jordan. We have Sean Bishop, under 20 national team head assistant head coach of Uganda. we have tony kokia kunnas national team coaching staff member and scout of finland national team we have ranjit bajaj director of mirarwa punjab football club and the owner of delhi fc we have rido burden head of performance and conditioning goyana national team we have zishan khan who is a content creator and popularly known as talk football hd on social media and we have hans gupta as the co-host and myself as the host and there will there will be two members who will be joining in while we start with the conversation one of them is nur alam who is the head coach of kerala blasters academy and second is yash arora who is also a content creator and popularly known as yj reviews and unfortunately we couldn't have asasio santos who is the assistant head coach of nigeria national football team because he is busy with some upcoming interviews and meetings so he'll be available after 11th of march so to start today's conversation we have hans gupta who will be taking this forward so hans over to you thank you so much sagal hello everyone thank you for having me and thank you so much for joining the session so i would like to start the session from peter sir so first of all many many congratulations to peter sir and the jordan team to you know perform very well in the afc cup and you guys have given very commendable performance over there so my question to you starts with that what like what is the secret sauce that how like you think as you're a coach of under 20 national team so how you think like that how the jordan has really improved before afc cup and right after the results you have got like you kept on beating south korea on in semi finals and unfortunately you guys lo- uh, lost in finals but after that how the model of jordan uh, regarding football has changed and how you guys are looking to develop youth football to give better results in future Okay, hey, hello, nice to meet you everybody. Um first of all, yes, it was a great experience and it was a good um situation for the Jordan football. 
Um, yeah, if you look to the whole process, how it was going, uh, the preparation was not that good. Uh, they, they tried to do the World Cup qualification and they lost against uh, Saudi Arabia and they played draw in Tajikistan. Because it was not that good. And um, yeah, if I look to the whole situation, I think um, especially um, a couple of players, they play uh, abroad in uh, from Jordan. And, and this is uh, very good uh, for Jordan football. Because you see the last game against uh, Qatar. Then Jordan had to make the game. And then it was uh, very, uh, was not good. And uh, it is... Um, a little bit the situation um, where they were very lucky in, in the situation against uh, Iraq and yeah, that they get uh, that they get scored in the last minute and the opponent get a red card. Yeah, there's a little bit luck of the tournament. And I think um, if I look to the whole situation, um, for sure Jordan football is coming and becoming better. Only the infrastructure and... Um, Everything has to become much better to uh, be successful every time. But uh, you see in, in Jordan on his own, um, they have a lot of talents. And um, especially um, since we, yeah, I mean, since the director, the technical director is from Holland and he is, they give him a chance and he's working already five years there. I think he did a great jo job in uh, playing more um, and better matches. And uh, yeah, especially more and uh, the competition more structure. And I think this is an uh, it was a very good thing for um, for the situation inside Jordan. And uh, and then you are absolutely making more progress. But uh, still, there is a lot of work. But uh, um, I think this the the main situation now in Jordan um, that. Um, yeah, that the, the players who in, in playing in foreign countries that they make the the yeah the the situation different and better for Jordan uh, football, and um, also at this moment the tactics uh, to give the opponent the ball and uh, play more on the counter uh, situation. I think this is uh, suitable for this team at this moment. Of course, right, in the so youth. The players, so the yeah. players playing in abroad are influencing more to your national team, right? Sorry. The players of Jordan, which are playing, who are playing in abroad countries, are influencing yes. more to your national team, right? Yeah, they make a big influence in the in the football. They make the difference also in the games. You see uh, that the two strikers they make the two difference in the in the games, and I think this is uh, this is uh, what was making the the situation good, and also the tactics of. Uh, yeah, going, going a little bit more back and waiting for the counter. And this is a specialty um, from these two players for sure. And then you see that you uh, can be successful also in this uh, in these tournaments. Yeah? All right. so, hey, Peter, question. Hey, Peter, on the team, yes. was everybody born in Jordan or were there any internationals that were uh, grew up abroad and came back and played for the senior team? No, most no, no. At this moment, uh, all of them from Jordan, because they were so not. They uh, yes, they don't grow up in uh, in other countries. There's, uh, there's in this situation, it's not like uh, Qatar <laughs> or uh, uh, other uh, countries. No, they are born in uh, and they, 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 uh, yeah, they, they get a chance abroad and they develop them very, very good. And this is, uh, this is very suitable and uh, good for the national team, I think. All right. So, right. sir, you told a small line like, we need better infrastructure. So, when you mention better infrastructure, what do you mean? Like, what kind of infrastructure? Uh, okay. I think many coaches were, but I hear they are abroad. And if you have, um, I give you a couple of examples, but it's like, um, I'm now coach for the 20 national team. And um, so, we cannot train because we don't have field. Yeah. And if we have a field, it's a very old artificial field. Uh, and um, it's like uh, stones instead of uh, fields and, and this kind of things. Uh, there, is, there, is, there are not many fields here uh, where you can play good football and where you can um, be sure, be, yeah, that you can, for example, train two times a day. There is no space. Uh, and this kind of things is a big, big problem for Jordan football. 
to develop and also some competitions they cannot play because there are no fields for children uh, and this is um, I think very very hard for uh, for the Jordan situation and that's why I think the infrastructure that they have to put a lot of effort to give um, clubs more, uh, more more fields and everything the main clubs the big clubs only have one field for for all the teams and and this is uh, and it just, uh, and then this is absolutely not good for uh, Jordan football and for the for the for the future okay so you are, according to you there's a lack of facility and maintenance of the fields you know that are problematic to the Jordan team for the youth especially you know because you guys have built up no, a great team but, you know but i i also for the first teams eh, if you see uh, where they have to play their games mm -hmm. um you play on hard artificial fields um, where the ball is uh, bouncing one time and then you have to wait 10 minutes because it's coming down uh, later. Uh, this kind of things is, uh, of course, for the football inside Jordan and for the for the games, it's not attractive to see. Then the yeah. supporters will stay away and everything will be like that. And I think uh, this, this has to be uh, changed very quick uh, from the government and from the football association to, to at least to try to get more and better fields. Thank you so much, Peter. So, my question over to Zishan Bai, that uh, right after listening to Peter's explanation regarding the Jordan's development and how these guys have improved, what do you think? Like, somewhere you also know that in also we face lack of facilities and maintenance, right? But still, the Jordan has spot up to, shot up to 17 ranks and got to 70th of FIFA and we are getting to 115. So, what's your point of view on this? Well, we all know that infrastructure is very important for the development of players. But as Peter was talking about, that the fields are not good. The balls keep on bouncing. I believe that the players are... Uh, firstly, for it's very important that the young players, they develop on their technical ability. But I also heard Peter was mentioning that the coach emphasizes their play mostly on counter-attacks, that they give the ball to the opponents and they wait for the perfect opportunity to counter. Uh, in India, we can keep on finding the reasons, the excuses, if you will, that why aren't we success and we can line up a whole list of reasons this is the reason why we don't find the success but with limited resources if jordan was able to do that in that particular competition we should be we, instead of getting jealous instead of uh, finding reasons and excuses we should try to work on ourselves see the government has not done the maximum that we would want them to do they haven't helped us at the uh, best of the levels but even with limited resources, if a country is able to produce such kind of results, we should we should really take that as an example and try to influence our youth. Even our senior players should take that uh, and, and instill in themselves that, you know what, fine, if there's a rocky pitch, still the players, the senior players are able to play at that level and, and achieve a feat which would make the whole country proud. For the national team, I, I believe we need to do a bit more. The players, they need that top quality match to compete at oh, that okay. level. And what Jordan has done, it's only a source of inspiration for us all. All right. All right. Thank you so much. So, we also have Sean Bishop, sir, right? Of uh, under 20 Uganda national team coach. If I'm wrong, not wrong, right, sir? You are in kind of your assistant coach, right? Yes. Yes. Right now, so I'm assistant I, coach. You have, been, you have been coaching under 20 teams. So, you're very connected to youth, right? So, what yeah. was your experience and how you think that is the facility or the uh, top quality coaches or top quality games, how it is affecting country in a positive or negative manner? Well, um, there's an upswing in South African football right now. Um, having come third at uh, FCON a couple of weeks ago in Ivory Coast, uh, I do think that... Um, the development of youth within in South Africa is is really really good. Uh, unfortunately, the distances between South Africa and and, and Europe are are just too far uh, for someone to come and watch football matches in South Africa is 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 too far. Um, with regards to facilities, uh, we also have the same challenges in Africa, uh, but it's all over the world and and really right now. Um, as youth development people and, and coaches, we, we have to come up with the solutions. Uh, Africa, uh, South Africa has really, really good facilities all over the country, but then you also ho have the post-apartheid legacy of, of the townships where there are um, uh, no facilities, but the kids make plans, the people make plans. And um, 
Uh, I don't think you need a full-size pitch to coach youth football. Uh, I also coach um, in Portugal, and um, I can see a, a whole 11 v 11 pitch cut into to six fields, and uh, the kids get on with it. And this is in Portugal. This is in a first world country. Um, I think it's it's uh, us. It's it's time for coaches. We're always complaining about our players not seizing opportunities and um, getting out of their comfort zones. And it goes to us coaches as well. We have to put our hands up and 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 get out of our comfort zones and go and see what the rest of the world looks like. I mean, for a for a coach like Peter to go to Jordan from from the Netherlands, that's, I mean, that's something amazing. Rido Rido has just gone to the Philippines from the comfort and uh, of Cape Town, which is a world class city. So. Um, for me, the development of youth starts with us, uh, us as coaches. Uh, we have to come down to, to a situation where we fit into their environment. Everyone has, I mean, look at you, you're, you're, in, you're in India and you're asking about Indian football development and you have a flag of Man City on the wall at the back. Why don't you have a flag of an Indian football club at the back? So really these well. are, you know, these are very, very important questions. What is the culture of football? What is the culture of football in your country? Um, I've taken the Uganda job because I just saw some amazing stuff here when, when, when I came to visit the country. Well, basically, I'm in Ghana right now for the All-African Games. But um, the movement, what the Football Association is doing in Uganda right now, let me tell you, watch out. Um, they have a president who doesn't stand for anything. He's on TV every Thursday night in a panel, live on TV, and the fans and the population of the country, 40 million, can phone in and hold him accountable and ask him questions. And he's he's on top of his game. Um, example, on our way here, we, we weren't booked a hotel in Ethiopia. Uh, we made a call to him. 30 minutes later, we were on a bus to, to a hotel in Ethiopia uh, in, our, in our layover. So the leadership has to come to the party. And everyone here on this call right now is the leadership. And um, it, it's up to us. Our, our youth are demanding it. And, and in India, there needs to be a real differentiation of development at the younger ages and then when does winning become paramount? And uh, I think you have to be careful with that. Now, that Jordan is ranked 70th and India is 115th. I, I, I mean, that's really not the issue. I think the big things, and, and Sean nailed it. He talked about commitment. Uh, the federation leadership is probably, as it applies to India, the most significant thing that you just brought up, Sean, was the transparency of the federation leadership and that is just huge in these countries and, and then when you talk about um development infrastructure you're talking about money in terms of uh infrastructure right now in india there's not a return for people to say hey we're going to invest millions of dollars and there's going to be an immediate return maybe you know at, at the end of the day there can be a return but it's going to be based on uh philanthropic things the federation which i think is really important in india because india wants to have more global uh reach and and be thought of as a world player not as 115th in the world in football which i think everybody would agree is is underachieving um drastically so how do you get that kind of transparent leadership with a vision that to me is is amazing you know if uganda has that it's probably clear that there is talent there and then how many years are you willing to put into this talent development and, and what does that mean i i don't you know i don't know you know yeah, um, I mean, we, we beat nigeria last night 2-1 so um yeah, the, the winds of change are, are happening. Um, and yeah, it's a, Uganda is a country of 14 million and um, they live and breathe football here yeah, everywhere. And um, yeah, they, 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 they want to be at the, at the highest um, 
level. So you're, you're right. You're right, Jeremy. Spot on. And, and with that being said, I think was it was it Sean or um, Peter? It's being brave and going out and playing football nations. And and um, you know Nigeria has done extremely well. You know Olympics. You know World Cup youth. The the you know I don't know who Jordan who you guys played against uh peter you know who you got to test yourself but in india that's a huge one you gotta you gotta go out there and regularly play top teams and you know in asia that means it's japan and south korea clearly you know at the younger levels uh maybe qatar and jordan you know but you, you got to get regular matches from 15 up until your senior team and get exposure and uh, see what your strengths are and what areas uh, you need to improve upon. So, okay. I just want to come in there. I totally agree with what Jeremy is saying. In fact, um, that's a serious thought here because even if you have a good team, you don't get... You need to play with teams which are better than you to improve, not even with good teams. Teams which can actually outclass you because you learn only then. You don't learn by going and thrashing a team 20-0 or 18-0, which is happening to any good uh, team. And Jeremy's uh, nodding his head because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. So, that is the reason <clears throat> the real development can only happen, like he said, if the philanthropic way or the federation gets in. But the federation doesn't have any money. And they're dependent on FSDL Reliance, a private body, giving them whatever handout they can. It, I think, needs to be, like he says, if we want to be a world power, it need, the government needs to step in. Because for the government, a um, 1,000 crore grant, which is 10 times our budget right now, current budget, is nothing. It's peanuts. And they're already doing that to probably 20 other or 30 other games. So it's not going to be something out of the blue. In fact, we've got a state government who's doing more than that. Their sports budget is more than what the Indian Kelo India Games budget is. That's Urissa. And one state has done that for hockey in India. Um, I know, I mean, they are... There are people here from the coaches here from Holland and they're from South Africa. And uh, so you'll notice that India had a downfall. We were great in hockey. We were eight-time Olympic gold medalists. But at the same time, we were also Asian Games medalists and we came third or fourth in the Olympics in the 60s. The same yeah. time, the decline took place. So we had the Jordan coach tell us that, you know, we had horrible grounds and the ball would bounce. So from the very beginning in Indian student or Indian uh, because the grounds are so bad, it's taught to them that do not pass, don't even think of passing the center back, just hoik it long. Just hoik it long, simple as that. And doing that, they've, and then you then they come to the senior level, you expect them, or, or in the club level, the coaches say, okay, why don't you start passing out from the black? And then why can't they do it? And why can't they move the ball around? It's because it's not in their DNA. What I mean, is not in their muscle memory. And it's... You don't have decision making. I don't believe in decision making in football. I believe that it's muscle memory. That means the number of times you do it before the age of 12 or 13 or 14 max is the habits you form for life. And to rework those muscles is very, very tough. So what I believe is that, yes, maybe if you give great facilities to our seniors, they might just pull a, might just pull a Jordan off what Jordan did in the Asian Cup. But that's about it. But do you, if you want a consistent performance and you want all your teams to be challenging for top the top spot, you got to change things at the bottom. So one club, one academy like Minerva, we've taken it on ourselves that we will get to the World Cup in 2034. And how are we going to do that? We're going to do that by getting 100 boys from all over India, what we can scout, um, all under the ages of 12, which we did four years ago. And by the time, hopefully out of those 100, seven, eight, will not be playing for India. We'll be playing for some European club. So that when they come back to India, they can make India qualify. The whole aim is not to get good players to get them qualified to make them play in an ISL club. That will make us stay exactly where we are. The whole point is to yeah. send these kids to Europe. Now, how do we send them? By making them play great in the ISL? No. By making sure these boys go play the best in the world. Not only in Asia, in the world. At the age of 12, 13, 14, same boys. 15, 16, 17. And they build up a CV. So if they have this boy who's gone and scored against Barcelona under 12s and then the next year against Newcastle under 13s and then the next year against Bayern Munich under 14s, by the age of 15, 16, he'll be picked up by some good academy in Europe. 
and that boy might make it and we are looking for that first breakthrough because what's happening is that unless and until we have the first mohammed sala or for that matter the first park ji song a spark is not going to come the revolution needs to start you know here's an interesting thing about india in my mind and, and don't be offended by this people i got the sense and this was in the football community there's a fear of failure that the idea of like saying hey we're going to get out of our comfort zone we might go visit we you know as coaches or as players or as teams we're going to go to these footballing nations and we have to say hey we need to learn we need to get better and and it's such a proud country and such a successful country people i think are unwilling to get uncomfortable at times exactly but you only grow out of your comfort zone you don't grow when you're yeah. getting comfortable it's simple you right i exactly. agree with you yeah so just a small yeah. question to steve sir as ranjit sir just mentioned the concept of his 2034 world cup badge steve sir what are your views on that well i i know mr ranjit bajaj very well and i know the project that he wanted to do because we had quite a talk about it ourselves together and and it is a project where i think with the right movement and the right demand the training sessions that there is a possibility indeed now i also think that we cannot reflect too much on what jordan has done for one time because they've done it for one time now they have not done it consecutively and this is one of the words that mr bajaj was saying indeed it needs to be done consecutively and within the under 13s 14s 15s and keep moving up um the project that he's doing and some of the other clubs we are doing for an example at united with a with a much lower budget uh, mr nabab atasharia is trying his utmost <laughs> best um and that is also known within the footballing world that if you are consistent with what you are doing and this is what for an example what we are showing on a lesser way than mr bajaj because yeah sorry to say but we don't have that budget that we can do but in our under 17s which we have worked now for two and a half years with we have beaten mohan bagan east bengal mohammedan odisha jamshedpur and now we have gone at today we played east bengal in the reliance league which we have beaten we have beaten mohammedan we are first in the in the group right now which on our side is not the main objective because our under 17 team and our rfdl team 50% of our senior team in i league 2 and that knows mr bajaj also because we played against each other last year um he also has seen that our team is a very young team and we give the chance to our young players to play on a senior level already now indeed the step for indian football needs to be to bring players to europe to get them over there to play in those leagues over there and for me one of the the, the biggest examples where i've worked for an example and it's a little bit like my colleague from the netherlands now in uganda i've done this in mali for an example and in mali now as everyone has seen in the under 17 they reached the semi final of the world cup beating argentina should have gone to the world cup final there is loads of players of the senior team who are now playing for tottenham red bull leipzig uh, hoffenheim playing for cadiz in la liga they have done the same thing they started with very young players they trained them consistently for a long period and they've given opportunities to players to go to europe and to get contracts there and play at the top level now as jordan has done as other countries are doing these players come back to your national team and they improve the level of the players who are here now one of the problems that i see there is the salaries that indian players are getting and not only in isl i'm not talking in i league because i league is a different story the level there for a lot of the indian boys is lower 
And I'm not talking Gokulam or Mohammedan, but I'm talking Neroka, I'm talking Trahawa, I'm talking Rajasthan. The level of salary is not that high. But as a lot of you also know, in West Bengal, in Kerala, in Goa, now also already in Meghalaya and in Sikkim, there is huge money in the local tournaments. So a player doesn't even want to play High League 2 anymore. So we, for an example, we have scouted young players that we have tried to attract to come and play in High League 2 for our club. And they tell us we don't want to come and play because we earn more money in a five-a-side tournament, in a seven-a-side tournament, than going to fight for our spot and go direction uh, I League or even to ISL. And I can go that far that I know one of the players, top, top players in I League last year, went to play a five-a-side tournament, 20 minutes, and he received two luck. Two luck for 20 minutes just being on the pitch. There are players before the East Bengal Muan Bagan match this year. I cannot say which player. It's all up to you to find it out. What or how? But I do my homework. One of the players played <laughs> the day before, the day before in a five-a-side tournament, and the day after he needs to go and play in the big Kolkata Derby in front of. I think, what is it, 50, 60,000 people in the stadium and he needs to go and play over there. And everyone knows it. Everyone looks at it. But except a couple of people, if it is Mr. Bajaj, if it is Mr. Nabab, who speak out about these things, no one talks about it and no one does anything about it. And it is these things at the end that is stopping the development because you can develop these young players for years and years and years. And if they end up in the same story as all the other players, it will still not help forward. So I really hope with the question that you asked me, a project as Mr. Bajaj with his World Cup batch, I really hope that there are players who can go to Europe. And it is something that I've been willing to do also into Indian football, that they can go to Europe that they play at the proper level and that doesn't have to be immediately like I see the flags, Man City, Bayern Munich or Liverpool, but the proper, proper level in Europe because that level will help the players here realize what you can do with going to Europe. And the problem stays. If you earn too quickly, too much money here, why will they get out of that word that you used, the comfort zone? Why will you do that if you can get it here by doing very little and by staying at your level? Because you don't have to be afraid of the players behind you because the same players stay in ISL and there's almost no one going into ISL except when a player retires, a young player comes in there. And this is one of the problems that has been arising, not having enough players, uh, clubs in ISL, not having enough clubs in I-League. If there are more clubs, more Indian players will be playing. And that those players need to go to Europe. If it is Jordan, if it is another country, if it is Uganda, I've worked in Mali, I've worked in Ghana, I've worked in Egypt. All these players only have one ambition, go and play in Europe. That's the main ambition. And that needs to be the ambition of the Indian players. And I really hope, Mr. Bajaj, that your players can do that. I hope that I can send some of my players with yours because... If we are talking about scouting, for an example, for the youth national teams, now I'm here two and a half years, almost three years in Kolkata. I have never seen a scout. I have never seen anyone coming at our matches. If it is under 13, 15, 17, 19, 21, 23, how will you look at these players? Yes, my players are smaller than the players of Tata because we played against Tata in the week. We are very much smaller. But he can't beat us. So so it doesn't mean about small, big, what or how. It's about the quality. And so, that is what is missing here. And Mr. Bajaj, I, I see you going immediately. It's correct. Everyone or most people still, it's big bodies, shooting from far at the goal, no thinking, and just winning. That's the only thing that is 
taught in 99% of the cases. And we had talks, we had some disagreements, we had some agreements. Great, you are working your side, which I really appreciate. I'm doing it my way with United, with Mr. Nabar, and we are trying to do something. And, and Steve, I think you guys are doing such a great job, especially with Nabab and you guys, because see, the point is Portugal doesn't have any big players or big size, not a Spain. Size in football actually doesn't matter at all. In fact, it's a disadvantage for me. For me, it's about low center of gravity. Mm. But I mean, that's another argument for another day. But your arguments about uh, me doing it, but do you understand that we are a country of 1.5 billion? It should not just be me doing it. And you're saying that, you know, your budget is uh, small compared to mine. But trust me, my budget compared to an ISL club is 100. So imagine what these 10 or 15 billionaires who are out there can do if they really want to. Because they've got better coaches than you and United and Minerva. They've got better facilities than both of us. They've got better uh, contacts abroad than both of us. And if for the last 10 years, any one of them had actually put their head down and said, OK, fine, this is all we want to do and develop players for our country, not for our club, for our country, we would have been 10 steps closer. We need everyone, not one Minerva. Imagine if what I'm doing, at least 20 other clubs are doing. So imagine the talent pool, which will be not just choosing from four centre-backs, but 40 centre-backs. Yeah. So, hey, Peter, sir, I would like to hey, ask one thing. Like, you know, the conversation is... Yeah, yes, sir. Just, just, just me, sir. Continue. You got these, you know, you got, is it Rito, Sean, Peter, and Tony? Like, let's take advantage of them because, you know, we've all like had discussions amongst ourselves you know steve ranji you guys myself but take advantage of this other perspective in terms of i think that i think otherwise we're not there, there's not enough focus on this call and then you're not taking advantage of these guys that have left the comfort of their countries and have explored and what are the key metrics of measuring you know how, how to measure development what do they see as hindrances i agree i totally agree i mean that that's totally it i mean that's the reason we want to learn from them well, that, agree. that's why i was just wanted to ask this question to peter sir as like uh, yeah. every like steve sir indeed sir and jeremy sir also said that in india we lack from many things like facilities funding more etc etc so, Peter also told us that they lagged with the facility. So, uh, Peter, I just want to ask you that the Jordan showed a very commendable performance. So, the government was the one who stepped in and funded the team and funded your development? Or who was the one or which body gets in with the funding which helped you guys? No. To the, the, um, okay, first of all, let me clear one thing. Uh, you asked me the question, uh, what they can do better in Jordan, eh? That you don't ask me the question because I said the infrastructure can be better. Now let me let me think let me speak a little bit about the questions before that I say okay. okay. For my point of view, it's like um, for example, the first time I start here in Jordan, I had 120 players, and from these 20 from these 120 players, I had to choose 23 players plus four goalkeepers. I in the in the range of 50 kilometers, all the clubs in Jordan are here. The the competitive way they play against each other is good. Does you see that the, the the choice I have from 120 players instead of India? Okay, that's a that's a big 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 difference. And I think uh, and exactly what uh, was said before about scouting. If there is not, nobody scouting and you and you select uh, 40, 60 center defenders and 40, 50. Okay, then, then you, 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 you make yourself so big problems that you every time change the players and then you, and, and the, the systems they're playing and the ideas, you don't develop the players uh, to be successful in the future. Does you step much more quicker than me because I have not too much choice. I have to do it with this player over to other players. There's the development from these players in India is, 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 is very difficult. And I was four years in China. And in China, you can see China also in world football, not good. Eh? If you see, and, and it's the same like India. 
because you are so unbelievable big countries the the, the scouting and the ideas and and to give uh, for me you have to have five six centers uh, and in India for development uh, youth players and and from there on you from these five centers you select for the national teams uh, some players and this this is the only way you can be successful if you training in the same way and you do it the same way if you look to yeah. Holland we are a very small country but every town every city every city has a club everybody yeah. can play football and everybody is helping each other to become uh, better in this way and i think in this way um in india you have to make five six centers and there put the best players and start keeping these players and not say ah this one not good we take another one this one and then you don't develop them for the future and i think this is the biggest problem was in china was the same ah they said ah this one is not good ah take another one uh, this one not good yeah. take another one and we don't, and they don't invest. I said, hey, give them, give this boy a, a year time in the national team to develop because they learn the system, they learn the way of life, and then you will bring players more abroad uh, to other countries because then you will see that they develop in a good idea. But if you change too much times and too many times from players, yeah, this will never work. And and then um, and then you see that the the, the development and the and everything will fall down in this kind big countries. And I think that's a, that's a, I think a very um, very uh, situation I was seeing in China, and and what I see here again in India, it's I think the same situation. Right. So I have a question. Right. So the for more you so the more you okay. play together, the more you grow. It's like this. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. yeah. No, so I, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So I have a question for Sean, sir, Rido, sir, and Tony, sir three of you i had a, like as we were discussing previously like uh, steve sir told about indian players needs to go to europe so talking about finland uganda or philippines if the are the players going to europe and does those players influence the next generation of the players for them to you know push harder to go to europe is it happening this way sean sir if you could start yeah um, I don't know, I'm going to sound a little bit controversial right now, but Europe isn't the be-all and end-all. Um, first of all, it's like all of us here are wanting to marry the supermodel. Uh, it, it, it's not going to happen. And in, in, in what I've realized is success is an outlier. You've actually got to look at the average. And uh, everyone in their coaching sessions or in the academies will talk about creating the next Messi and creating the next Ronaldo. But what about creating the next Rido, the next Jeremy, the next Steve? Um, these are the players that are actually going to make it. And uh, we all know the guys who here are in football. It's usually the average ones that, that come out of top. Let's let's take Messi and Ronaldo off the off the page. They they outliers. We all know that, um, and we're very blessed to have seen them in our lifetimes. But, you know, it, it, that, that is a thing. And uh, I think you're talking about the long-term development of a player here. Um, human capital takes time. And uh, you don't send your child to school or to medical university and hope they're a doctor in three weeks. It's not going to happen. So um, that's us as coaches. We, we have to clearly understand that. Um, Rido's here and he'll, he'll probably add more about physical development of players. But children do not, my, my son is 15 years old, playing with an under-19 side in Portugal. He's the only one not shaving in his teeth, but he's technical. And yes, he gets bullied and he gets beat and he gets hit and he can't win a header and things like that. But but the coach clearly understands he's the most technical player there. Um, and, and he just deals with a guy that's got a beard that's been shaving since he was 11 years old. And that's okay. That's normal. Um uh, I think uh, Steve spoke about the winning mentality. Look, I, I firmly believe no child plays football without wanting to win. We have to learn how to integrate winning into our development. And um, that, that that is a, an integral part of development. Your average player that I'm talking about that goes on and makes it, he's a winner at heart. He, he just wants to win. So I think um, uh, as, us as coaches, we, we have to take responsibility. Yes, I know we talk about facilities and we talk about, 
but but guys, we have to get on with it. Um, you can't wait for a government official that's going, who, who's running for president to make decisions for you. You just cannot. And um, these are the things uh, I think everyone sitting here in this room has paid something called football school fees where you have to go buy a ball for a kid or a pair of boots for a kid or something like that. That is the reality of football. It's not not the big clubs, the Liverpools and Mans. They are they are outliers. They are not they are not normal. They are abnormal, and we we have to learn to to appreciate that and 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 make sure we go on and um and and develop. But yeah, th thanks guys. Um, I actually have to go. It's match day minus one for me. I have training now at uh, five o'clock. Um, we have Ethiopia tomorrow. So, yeah, I, I really hope we can carry on this conversation and I'll be invited again. Um, really fantastic, and, I, and the input here is brilliant. Thank Best you so much, luck, Thomas. my brother. Thank, Best thanks, of guys. Luck. I, I hope you guys. And, I hope and, you guys. And, good and, luck. So, get, just you can share my details with everyone, please. I'm, yeah. I'm more than happy to um, speak to everyone, except with Rita. Don't share my details with Rita. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thanks, everyone. Rita, I love you. Miss you. Cheers, everyone. Thank you, Good luck. Sean. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Good luck for tomorrow. Good, good luck, Bishop. Good luck. All right. Yeah. So, as Sean sir said, you know, like not only the players, the coaching staff members, the scout, everybody, you know, it comes together as a team game, right? So, football is a team game. We all know it. The only player cannot run it. So, my question is to Tony, sir, as you are a national scout and coaches staff member of Finland. So, it's kind of a question which is coming from a youth player also. That what are the basic criteria that you see in a player while scouting them? Like, what is the checklist which you see while scouting a player for a national team or for any club? Okay, yeah. Hello, guys. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, actually my at the moment. I'm I'm uh, working as a as a uh, coach in our national team. It's the seventh seventh year in this is. Uh, but I have a background of, uh, of being a club uh, last year also. We were with my, my club, HAK, we were we won the championship and we were in the conference league group stages. And uh, in previous, I've, I've been working with uh, in, in our FA with uh, players development uh, and, uh, and as, a, as a head of it. And uh, also, I have a long history and I'm still doing the coach education, our UFA Pro and A license. So I have a Long, long history uh, being in, in uh, working in Finland, but uh, being involved with uh, international football for long. Uh, uh, about Finland, we are very. Uh, the colleague here was saying that Holland is a small country. <laughs> we are half of it. <laughs> we are only five point five million. <laughs> uh, we are up north here. So, and our biggest problems are maybe that uh, we are too. We are too. Uh, everything is uh, too good here. We are the happiest people in the world for the sixth year in a row. Everybody's life is good. We are competing with uh, uh, maybe with other challenges here to get the players uh, to really put uh, put uh, effort on being a top top footballer. Uh, education is uh, very important here for all the uh, we, as we as parents we are very very strict that our kids go to school. We have been in the very, very, very educated people here. So we have uh, kind of different kind of uh, problems, but not so not so bad problems, but concerning okay. football. But uh, but that's a bit about, the, I don't know how many you, you know that the background of uh, that the Finnish football, but uh, I was lucky enough to be in the 2020. We, we made the first time to the Euro finals and uh, uh, and uh, we've been ever since when we, we we came in, we've been in the national like the nations league, the B B league. So, and what, listening about uh, what you but I, I come back to the talent soon. But just uh, trying to explain well, uh, what what we are about. So I think it's all about uh, the the good structure that you have some idea what what works in your country. I I heard some good ideas about this. Uh, aerial uh, centers and so on and then you, you but you have to have a, a clear uh, idea behind how you want to scout players how you want to educate the players here we have started with uh, it's very uh, we put a big effort on the coach education we have a very good coach education
notification system because the coaches are the ones who are supposed to help the players uh, to, to get well, better. So I think we start from there and that's very important that we have uh, clear uh, scouting systems. Uh, we, are, we are a small nation, but we are in a big country. So we have also this uh, regional centers that we, we, we have to have because our uh, it's 1,300 kilometers long our country so uh, so there's a uh, lot of cities also up north and but I if behind that it has to be long-term planning we, it, in, in football you don't get uh, like uh, quick uh, wins yeah so Tony so when yeah, you look at a player great. as being you know yeah. as being a scout you're a national level scout so when you look for a, you look to a player and you want to scout it so, like as you mentioned that you have taken your team to a very big level you know, to the conference yeah, league, the national well, B league. So, what you look in a player? Take yeah, one step well, back, though, with Tony. Here, here's what yeah. t- here's what he just said, which I think, before preface what he's looking for, he, here's what resonates with me: long term planning, consistency, identity. They know their strengths. They're educated. They're humble. They know who they are. So it's not that they're. They're not overachieving. They know who they are. And it's the same with the Netherlands. It's the same with Belgium. Yeah. They know who they are. They know their strengths. And they consistently achieve. Now, the beauty of this discussion is, <laughs> hey, if you're Belgian or you're if you're from Belgium or you're from Netherlands or uh, you're from Finland, you've already been there. You know that, so it's just a matter of hey, continually achieving. India is amazing. One point five billion people. There is talent. There are good enough sure. fields. I mean, India. I, I don't know if you guys have been there. You know, Tony and Sean and uh, Peter. Man, it's amazing. There's good players there. It's it's amazing. But they don't yeah. – in, in the United States, to me, is a really good model. Because the United States, we still don't have an identity as footballers. Yeah. You know, we have so many people and so much money that – I just saw the Federation budget's $200 million this year. But we don't have an identity. You know, we're, we have a good national team, but it's not all – it's only half of them are U.S.-developed players. We don't have an identity. So you guys have an identity. You're unique. I mean, Finland, no, you, when, when somebody asks me, well, are you interested in a Finnish player? I already have a picture in my mind of what that player's strengths are going to be. You know, same probably with uh, a Dutch player, you know. So South Africa, I don't know as much about. You know, South Africa seems like it's a real blending of cultures and players and strengths. But it's... You know, the things that Tony just said, those defining things, that's what the United States still needs to do. And that's what India needs to do. You, but but you got to play to your strengths. Indians are not going to be Spaniards. Indians aren't going to be Dutch players. They're not going to be English players. There's There's beautiful characteristics of Indian players that are really special. You got to highlight those. And then you got to continue to grow in certain areas and and take bits and pieces from, you know, these guys from football cultures. I'm not from a football culture, you know. I'm from the United States. It's not, it's not <laughs> like Netherlands or uh, Finland or you know. I mean, it's it's just different. You know, we're yeah. much more like India. I was just yeah. I was just uh, listening to Jeremy. He said that yes, there is talent in India. We have got huge potential, stuff like that. That's very very true. But what Tony just mentioned over there that in Finland, the, the people are willing to work together. They are humble. They are willing to work together, and that actually struck me the most over here in India. For what I have seen in 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 the years that I have worked with Indian football, I have not seen people who are willing to work together. There would be maybe a few people who get along and they work together. But for India to prosper, to reach at the maximum, for me, the national team comes first. But there are people and there are big people, industrialists, businessmen, who, for them, it's all about money. So 
uh, we we do have got a huge talent pool. Yesterday only the list for 35 men list for the Indian team came out that would be playing against Afghanistan in the World Cup qualifiers. There were 35 people and we still were talking about the 15 who are missing out. So we can potentially line up a list of 100 players who can in today's time maybe go on and play for the national team. So that is true. The talent is there. But uh, the willingness of people Nishan, Nishan, that goes from the you, federation. I, once again, I would just like to yes. add to that, bro. That if you you saying fifty because we're only taking ISL players. Exactly. I, you know that, and everyone knows who's played Indian football, ISL, I League, even second division, even Santosh Trophy. There are players who are as oh. good or better than this. In fact, Steve would immediately agree with me yeah, that I have that. seen such good players in the second division who deserve to be playing. Forget absolutely in the ISL in the national team. But they're not even they just overlook because they're playing in the wrong league. So, so that's where, uh, exactly Rajit, that's, that's where the combination, you know, of working, willingness, the harmony to work exactly together yeah. comes in. We do not pay attention to some leagues. I do not understand why there have been no scouting done from I-League or I-League 2. Even in the Santosh Trophy, uh, Rajit, sir, you might have seen the games, the players, sometimes they have been you scoring stunners. Football, and, man. I mean, and, if you've got to get these guys up. I'm I'm kind of a guy who would appreciate a better first touch than a blinder. I, I blinders are very common. Anyone can score. It's about timing. It's about the technique. But a first touch, players who play in the national team, they don't have that. So let's not. Yeah. Why don't we go on and get those players? So it's but the, the new guys lack of willingness of people. Division, by the way, yeah, bro. See, like for example, Steve's team, the United. Their first touch is so amazing because that's what he has brought them up with. These are the same boys, by the way who played against Minerva in the under-15 I-League uh, I League final. And we won a very close match against them. The same boys have gone up. Imagine the progression. And now they're playing in the second division and in the I-League. So, their first touch. So, imagine if you have somebody with the first touch, then you put a game plan. Instead of having superstars who have scored once in a yeah. while blinders, like you said, I totally yeah. So that's that's the thing, you know. Uh, over here, federation is a different unit. The FSDL, ISL, all together different unit. And yeah, then comes the coach. He's left alone aside to make his decision. Probably like a fall guy for all the problems that are going on. And yeah, uh, great, great uh, to hear from Tony. You might as well just continue with the initial question. I would definitely yeah, love to no hear problem. being okay, you being a scout. Uh, but can I can I intervene yeah. for a, a second? We were talking about an identity in in Indian football. And I heard Peter talking there before he was in China, which is a huge country, India, which is a huge country, and the problems that Jeremy or his country, the U.S., is having with having an own identity. The, the problem, I think, that lays there is the country is too big to have an own identity. You transfer this to Europe, and there is 52 countries who are combined with all the FAs. Belgium FA is different than the Dutch FA. Peter and I, if we look together at the Belgium FA or the Dutch FA, we are different. The French FA is different. The Spanish FA is different. And they look at different players. The problem is that you do the same in India here also, because Northeast is at looking at different players then the south of India, then the central of India, or then Kolkata. We are looking at different players and there is no identity because it is too big on one side and there is no one within, I think, the federation then, I think within the country who is putting a real guideline. And now I'm lucky that this week um, in Kalyani, um, the B license is going on. So I'm looking at, at the B license of AIFF being given right in front of me on my training pitches so I can go and watch at the training session. Now, I'm sure that the coaches or the people who have worked in India, they will be able to tell me the same thing. The course is saying something direction development, playing out from the back, play that ball around, do whatever you need to do, technical, tactical, everything. And you come within an under 15 and under 13, and it's only about winning. It's only about big guys. It's only about kick the ball forward, and everyone forgets it. And that is what I've noticed. If it, I've not been in South Africa, but I've, I've worked with some South African people before. I've worked in Africa. I've worked in Asia. And in a smaller country, 
It is easier to make an identity because people will follow quicker. If it is Finland, Norway, Sweden, they have their hard working. If it is Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, it's more their technicality. If it is Germany, it's their Sturm und Drang. Go forward, go press, go chase. And they all have their little identity. But now you need to put yourself the question, put all these countries in Europe in one country, like India, because we will still not have 1.5 billion people. Huh? We are still smaller, most probably. Huh? So put them all together and make one vision of this. Make one identity. It is not that easy. But I think with the things that we are bringing forward, with having five, six centers, I think it needs to be almost 10 centers. 10 centers in India, diverged over the whole country, bringing the best players of that region together and at the end making a mix direction the, the, the national team. Now, as we were saying, the Eagles team match is not coming to I-League. Today, for one day, he was in I-League because he came to watch uh, in Kalyani to, to Intakashi. He was here. I think it's just for the media, but he was here. Um, now, indeed, there are. Uh, I also see and I also know what is happening. So at the end, there are very good players all over the line. And every coach is looking different. And indeed, Mr. Bajaj is saying we are looking at, at, at a different style of play than, than most of the teams at the end. Now, if you combine that and you have a certain vision within your country, that's the way we want to play. That's what we want to go and do. And everyone starts following the national team will start improving. But I'm sure that we've said it. The U.S. is struggling. China is struggling. India is struggling. I think it is just because it is too big. And there needs to be some people, if it is a combination of Mr. Bajaj and Mr. Nabab and some other people who are actually doing something for Indian football, they should sit together and they should make a, a, a line or a process or, or, or way of development from a very young age that clubs and academies, because there are loads of clubs, loads of local academies, loads of coaching camps, and there is a lot of features and a lot of infrastructure in India. Not in every state, but I'm talking West Bengal. We have at least 40 stadiums, 40 that I know of, that are not being used properly. So you understand there is a lot of possibilities, but when you're in a huge country like this, it is not that easy like our friend from Jordan. All the teams are within 50 kilometers. It makes it a lot easier to, to find solution. Right. Here, it, I think Mr. Bajaj, together with Mr. Nabab, together with a couple of other people who are actually doing something for Indian football, put them together into a panel, let them write down instead of the Vision 2047, let them write down an actual plan, what can be followed by the local academies, and step by step from out of these local academies, players can be chosen for six, seven, eight, ten centers all over India, and then you need to have one super from the age of 14, 15, 16, like Claire Fontaine in France, where Mbappé, Benzema, Caron uh, all come from there, or in Belgium, Tubis. I'm sure in the Netherlands there is the same. Um, we have a centre like that. That needs to happen here. And then there needs to uh, be a plan in those 10 centres, what they want to do, how they want to play, and bring all the best players in one. That's, I think, how it should. And maybe our friend from South Africa, because we haven't heard him yet, South Africa is a big country also. But they had success already. They've had certain success. And maybe he can explain a bit more what, what is happening in his country. Yeah. So, Rido, sorry if you could go ahead with it. Yeah, no. Um, good afternoon, guys. Um, of course, thank you for having me on here. Um, I just think from, from my point of view, I mean, I'm obviously a strength and conditioning coach. I've worked... All over the world, from uh, the Far East, uh, I was with the Bangladesh national team. Uh, I worked. Uh, I've just signed now with the Philippines. I've been to the Far West with uh, the Guyana national team. 
uh, in Africa, I've worked with Togo, Gambia, Botswana, Tanzania, for example. And um, the difference that I found is that, uh, for, especially from an Asian point of view, which India obviously falls a part of, is a simple word. It's called periodization. So I think when we came to to Asia, when we came to Bangladesh, there was a lack of periodization, which is simple. It's a word of planning. Um, mm -hmm. So the planning within the federation, uh, the planning within the coaching structure, and of course, the planning and usage of football science, uh, you know, uh, of science of how we can develop players uh, from a strength perspective, um, how we can install this methodologies within the, the federation or within the club. So the most important thing is is the planning. Um, we found out in Bangladesh, um, look, they're also a, a country with um, millions of people. They are passionate about sport. Uh, they are passionate about football. But at the end of the day, it's not in their it's not in their culture in terms of work ethic. Uh, that's what we found out. So it was we had to find the balance between uh, football conditioning and of course uh, you know gym work for example. So uh, we found out that uh, the the Asian um, uh, players they were really limited to gym. You know so when they think of gym they're thinking of you know uh, big muscles and you know lifting up weights for example. But that is not in the in the environment of, of, of the country. So what we actually did now, uh, in fact, in, in the Philippines, we found the, the, same, uh, the same mindset is where when people think of strength work and gym work towards football, they are thinking about gym work. So what we did in the national team now, um, we actually brought the gym and we brought the gym to the field. So we know that the football uh, people, loving people, they love football. So they will come to the field and they came for local trials. Uh, we had now with the Philippine national team. And we actually now basically metaphorically brought the gym of weight training onto the pitch. And then we started to design football circuits that combines these exercises um, into more football specific uh, training, uh, whether it is strength training, whether it is good conditioning, for example, but it is more in a football-specific way because at the end of the day, we found out everybody is there because of the love of football. Uh, and then going to the far west as well, I, I worked with the national team of Guyana and people know Guyana as a cricketing country, just like India. So Guyana is basically made of West Indies. So it's a lot of, uh, you know, countries that's, that's made up of, of uh, that makes the West Indies uh, cricket team. So they are known for cricket. So it is so the, the investment that the government makes, the investment that uh, the Caribbean uh, countries make, it's all towards cricket. I mean, uh, we had uh, League uh, League A promotional playoffs to the Gold Cup, uh, and Guyana has never qualified for the Gold Cup, but we managed to come in, change the mindset of the people. That was that's the most important thing is to condition the mind, because at the end of the day. They are they are a cricket loving nation. You know, cricket is their first sport. So all the funds from the government is going towards the cricket side. So the men's national team, we obviously now struggling in terms of getting flights, uh, getting proper facilities, etc. However, within the the FA structure, if your coaching philosophy doesn't change, if your coaching philosophy is is deemed to develop and deemed to go uh, to deem to reach success then, of course, the other elements will fall into place. So we managed to, with Guyana, we managed to to not lose a game. Uh, we managed now to become in League A, which is with the big football nations like USA, Canada, uh, Mexico. Uh, so they now, Guyana, a small country with a limited of budget, they have now uh, progressed in League A. So it will be interesting now to see what the investment is because it's easy as well to to go into League A, but it's very difficult to stay there. So we have so Guyana sure. has to stay in League A to compete with the likes of the USA, Canada, Mexico, etc. But the only thing that we did when we came in as a coaching staff is that we had to change the mindset. We had to condition the mindset of the of the player number one. We had to condition um, the culture as well, not losing their identity, um, but also because they are not a football country, it was an opportunity to actually build an identity. Uh, you know, sometimes with the top nations, they already have an identity. They already have a, a way of play. Uh, if you talk about Spain, 
We know it's uh, tikka taka football, for example. When we talk about Germany, we talk about, you know, organized, aggressive, etc. But when you're working with a country that does not have an identity, I think you as a coaching staff, we have to be really, really strong on that because it's an opportunity to build. Um, and look, now uh, we took on a challenge in the, in the Philippines. We've got a, a huge qualifying game against Iraq coming in, in March. Uh, and of course, our bets against the wall. Uh, Philippines has never really, uh, you know, qualified for a World Cup, or even, you know, they're not consistent in the Asian Cup. But I think the most important thing uh, is that when you arrive there, you have to change, not completely change the culture, but at least install a football methodology. So the periodization is so so important. And uh, like you said, I've worked with Gambia as well in the in the last Afcon. It's a country with that's very very poor. Um, it's a country that never had a football league, so there's no local league. So some of the players were playing outside Gambia. Yes, some of the players were playing in Europe, maybe the third, fourth leagues, but they managed to come together, and then form a team. They of course bring a different type of professionalism into the local the local player. So when we started to combine uh, the, the experienced players or the players that are playing outside, uh, combining them with the local players, that's when uh, Gambia started to get success. Uh, we qualified now for the last two African Nation Cups, which they have never done. Uh, we, uh, Gambia has never won a game since 2013, since the, the new coach came in, uh, Coach Tom Sainfield, when he came in. Uh, and then uh, the most important thing he did was he just tried to change the the work ethic, you know, the work ethic of, of this uh, country. And um, lucky enough, now the players are playing in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. They are moving to Europe. And again, Gambia does not have a local league. But these are local players that are also going now to, to top clubs. Um, we had one example, a perfect example in Togo. Uh, in Togo, we had Emmanuel Adebayor. He played for Man City. He played for Real Madrid. He's top striker. And he never wanted to play for the national team because he always told us it's not professional. The training is not up to the level of where they are at the clubs. So that actually gave us an idea to say, we have to, as a national team coach, it's our responsibility to also improve the training at the national team, to let it be close to what the players are used to. So players that are, are, are coaching at, uh, or, are working at Marseille, at, at Manchester City, you know, you have to give them that same pace of training when they come to the national team. Otherwise, they're not going to, they're not going to waste, uh, you know, millions of euros to come and play for a country that's, number one, not going to pay them properly. Uh, number two, they obviously uh, worried about their health and the type of conditioning that they get. So I think from the federation point of view, we have to firstly up the standards of the, of the training method of the country, which needs to be aligned with where the players are coming from, from the clubs. So the situation that we had in, in Togo is what uh, we had top players that were playing. Uh, Emmanuel Adebayo, Alexis Ramal was playing for uh, Marseille at the time. Uh, Matthew Dosevi was playing for Standard Liège. So these were big, big players from Togo. But they never, ever wanted to play for their country because the country never had a league. And uh, luckily, you know, we had a coach that uh, we watched a few games, you know, guys playing in the streets. And honestly, the guys were playing on the beach. Uh, and the guys never ever had football boots on. They never played on a on a big pitch, eleven eleven big pitch on the on the grass. And there was one player that we took. The coach took him. We gave him boots. That was the first time he played with boots. And he he scored a goal for the Togolese national team. And uh, he's playing now for Raja Casablanca, Wida Casablanca in Morocco, uh, coming from non-league. So. So yes, it's 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 obviously not going to work for everyone, but I think there has to be a, a a a philosophy number one within the Indian Federation. That's the first thing, um, because like you say, you've got a billion people, and are you telling me from a billion people we cannot get eleven decent guys to compete uh, against other countries? Uh, there's something not right there. It's the same, it's the same challenge we had in 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 Bangladesh. We said the same thing as you guys have fifty million people. At least, come on, at least get together 15, 16 guys that are coordinated that can compete. We're not saying guaranteed to win because nobody is guaranteed to win in football. You know, at least compete that you say, okay, 
Um, and I hope now uh, with the Philippines, uh, now with the new uh, with the new uh, directors, with the new uh, president, I think maybe now uh, there's something smart happening at at, at Philippines uh, football. Um, you know they are investing, but they are investing in the right in the right channels. You know it's easy to have money, but if I'm spending it wrong, then what's the use of 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 having money? So. I think uh, it's an exciting project also from a, from a Philippines point of view, but also from a Southeast Asia point of view. Um, I know there's different opinions when it comes to conditioning. It's 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 even worse, you know. Um, the way the Europeans condition, uh, you know, players, the way Asia condition players, the way Africans perceive football, and it's the same in the US as well. So I think... From a from a from a sports science point of view, that's my my main background. I think that first need uh, football specific. That's the first thing, and then number two, it comes with planning. You know, periodization is, is so important. Um, I'm just going to use one more example. Um, when I was with uh, Guyana national team, um, the West Indies cricket team also was playing at the same time as the as the 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 men's football team. So for us, it was uh, history making because we are on the verge of going to League A, which never happened before. Uh, and then West Indies, they somehow pulled out of the, the World Cup and then they started the the, the IPL, uh, like the IPL that they had. And there was not one hotel available for the men's national team. And we are playing a huge game against Puerto Rico. And there's not one hotel available for the men's national team. There was not one flight available for us to go and fly uh, to play the way leg. Um, there was not enough money apparently. But again, we came, we found a way. Uh, and then, of course, from our side, uh, the players come first. So we were encouraging the government to say, listen, if the cricket team is flying business class, why can't the footballers fly business class? I'm not saying us as coaches need to fly business class. I'm saying the players. Because at the end of the day, they are the, they are the ones that are going to do the business on the field. So they need to be in a comfort zone. They need to be, um, you know, uh, more comfortable because they are going to do the business on the field. So if I'm going to ask you guys, uh, do you guys know what is the, the budget towards the Indian cricket team? I'm sure it is ten million dollars more than what it what it is to the to the to your football team. So once they can find that balance, then I think Indian ah, football will also brother. improve. My brother, uh, the the budget for the Indian cricket team and the football team, there's no comparison. I'll give you an example. The a total budget for the federation is around ten million dollars. The budget for the Indian cricket team is a billion and a half. Okay, so there's no comparison. So exactly. Totally. Uh, look, uh, Rajit, it's the same in Guyana. It's the same in Guyana. Exactly. Because you know they, and their their argument is. When cricket brings in so much of money for us, when football does, Correct. then we talk about it exactly. So, but yes. but how will you do that? Well, that's you know, that's the vicious cycle. Unless you put that money in, we'll never get there. Yeah. So again, what we did, we we turned it around. We said, okay, you don't want to go with the principle of invest in order for your team to perform. You want the team to perform first before you invest. Okay. So what we it was took on the challenges. Luckily, we've got a good team. Luckily, we have a team that hasn't lost. Now you're in League A. You've created history now in Guyana. So now, as a government, you need to say, hey, listen, you're now in League A. Surprisingly, if you don't get beaten 6, 7, 8, or 10 by the USA, because that's that can happen now. You're now in the league, in the big league, in the, in the CONCACAF region. You're in the big league. So if you don't invest now, then you will never invest in football. But what I liked about this, what the coaches did was they they put the responsibility on the on the government to say, listen, your men of soldiers on the field, they performed. They performed. They they won their games. You know, they qualified for the League A now. Now you are part of the best football countries in the region. And um, yeah, whatever holds for the future, of course, that is that is different. Um, we had the same challenges, like I said, in, in Bangladesh. Uh, okay, the president didn't have, uh, you know, the the patience maybe a little bit, you know, because we were only there for about, I think about four or five weeks. Yeah, we only took them, that was that was years back. And then, but yeah, uh, depending on what the coach did with Gambia, typical example, I mean, 
what he did with Gambia was history making. Um, and what he did in Togo as well was, was history making. So it's about the periodization, like I said, the planning. Yeah. And of course, the, the strong coaching philosophy. Right. So when we talk about the planning, we have Vision 2047 in Indian football. And I would like to, like previously, Jeremy Sir had told about it in a bit controversial way in the last discussion. And that went on to being taken up by a lot of you know, content creators and then they gave their reviews on it. But I would like to ask Zishan Bhai, like, I would like to start with Zishan Bhai and then we can get Ranjit Sir, Steve Sir's views also on it. Like, what do you think about the Vision 2047 planning? How we, How is it going to execute? See, it gives us a lot of hope. Uh, vision 2047, that we'll do this, we'll do that. And not once in the whole vision, the FIFA World Cup was mentioned. And I like that, you know, uh, the, the whole project was divided into a uh, few years, like first five years, what we have to do in the next four years, next five years, uh, what we have to do in the next upcoming 10 years. Uh, the basic... The, the most important thing was that we needed to focus upon our growth in terms of Asia. First, we needed to get in the top eight, then in the top four. And it was also promised by the coach that in the next four or five years, we'll get where we want to be, like top eight of Asia or top four of Asia. And uh, there were promises of making star players. And there were huge, huge, big uh, mentions of baits, I would like to call it like that. But yeah. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in what is written theoretically. I want to see actions. So there were a lot of things that were promised, the youth leagues, the, the uh, uh, for example, I would just like to mention the under 23 team coach, uh, Mahesh Gavli, he's, he was supposed to be taking care of that. But lately we just found out through Kale Now reporters that instead of him managing the under 23 team, he would be going along with the senior men's team because both the under 23 team and the national team would be playing their games in March. So how is that going to work? There is an under 23 team and, the coach who was assigned to them, he's not going to be there. Uh, we talked about philosophies here. We talk about legacy here. We talked about identity here. We talked about, Tony told us about the culture that you know, uh, we, we don't have that. There's no guarantee who's going to be the manager of our team. So I would just give this as a very simple example. Look at Dutch football. The way the national team play, the style of play, it resonates down to every last bit of the team be it Krufism style or not, but they play the Dutch way. And I'm not saying that in India, we need to play a certain style. I actually like the way in which we divide India in zones and we have a different identity. But there needs to be a guarantee. There needs to be a pathway that we can follow. And there needs to be threshold with milestones which, which we can cross and measure. This AFC Asian Cup was supposed to be a milestone. And the way we got out of it, the way we got thrashed out of it, it was really yeah. sad. And the co and the coach was getting the blame. The players were getting the blame. Uh, everything was separated. In India, we like to pick us apart when we are fallen rather than glue us together and build through that. Working together, what happened, happened. But there are again two games coming up. The World Cup qualifier are very important. And I don't care about a Vision 2047. I want to watch India play in the FIFA World Cup once before I die. And I believe most of the people over here in India want to, us to, to see that, you know, be there in the stadium. I got the opportunity to watch the FIFA World Cup final, Argentina versus France. I was there in the stadium. That was goosebumps for me. I, I, I was just thinking, if this is what I can feel watching Argentina play, what would I feel if I watch India play there? And I was there when India played the SAF Championship final against Kuwait and they won it on penalties. And I was I was crying. I was crying because that's what, you know, it makes you feel. Such a big nation without a lack of planning, it, it can't, it, it shouldn't go wrong. The next two games, I just want to talk about the upcoming fixtures. Afghanistan, we need to beat them. We, we get nine points. We beat in Kuwait in their own home ground. We get nine points in the upcoming two games against Qatar and Kuwait. If we manage to get another point, we are on 10 points. They are good for us to get into the next round of the World Cup qualifier. And if we get in that World Cup qualifier, we'll be playing good teams like South Korea. We can get teams like Japan and we'll get good Asian teams and uh, Ranjit sir and other uh, uh, people over here were talking about competitive oh. games. We yeah, need but those oh, competitive but games. No, yes, but yes, it is that I yeah, yeah. Totally really want you and your words right now which have come out of your mouth to just come true that we are able to get those 10 points but what happens? What happens after we get those 10 points? We go and play Korea and then what? Yeah. We beat Mostly them? out of, out of the top, top of my head we get thrashed. Yeah. They get thrashed so now, because, but now that, see, yeah. don't you think the conversation should stop thinking about that? Let's hope 
that we get through our group and it should now move on to let's hope we get through our group in the world cup because it's time enough to do that but we can only do that if like you said have quantifiable goals very beautiful vision 2047 according to the vision 2047 in 2027 for the world cup for boys and girls under 17 india needs to qualify on merit again coming that way that means in 2026 in the afc cup afc champions cup the asia cup they need to be in the top four of the under 16s but sorry eh? sorry eh? i've been and eh? i'm sitting now with the national team of jordan yes and and now i hear that you now i hear okay everything uh, everything what you're saying now it's only about your first team yeah yes exactly and and, and, exactly. and, and you say there is no coach for under 23 you're so big country and you don't have an an a coach for under 23 does so you don't look to any development at all bro not only that forget that so they want to qualify for the under 17 world cup on merit Maybe. They don't have an under-15 team right now. Next year, they yeah. want to be in the top four in Asia. Forget about having a coach. They don't have an Indian under-15 or under-14 or under-16 team right now. How the hell are they going to qualify for the under-17 World Cup in exactly. two years? So forget about yeah, the 20 because, Yeah, but then the scouting, you, you and, and that was what Steve was saying also, the scouting, you don't have at all. There's, there, is no, there is no infrastructure at all from, from the Federation side. Exactly. And, so and, there is no I think there, there is, is no pyramid. So exactly, we don't need to stop. We should stop talking about getting in this World Cup, getting to this right now senior team. No, look at ten years in advance. Invest in your 10, 9, 10, 11 year olds. Then maybe in ten years you're doing it. Forget talking about one or two years in advance. I mean, it's not like you like Steve was saying. You don't become a doctor in one year. Three you don't weeks, become a yeah. lawyer in one year. If you want to be the best in the world, it takes 10, 15 years of training. And that means you need to start at the age of 8. Not eight. start at the age of 15, which we do in mm. India. Because that's what we can do in cricket, yes. But in football, <laughs> if you start at 15, at 15, you have got people in Barcelona scoring for the national team and playing for Barcelona. Ranjit, so the thing is, uh, in India, people measure our success through what our national team achieves. The success of the yeah, national sure, team keeps us, keeps us afloat. The, the, the development of the young coach. I'll just take a, a few minutes and talk about what Arsene Wenger told about the development of young players. It's He said, and it's in a very sublime way, that the development of a young player is like a, like a making of a house. Firstly, you build their foundation. So when the guy is under eight, you let him let him have his football. Enjoy. Don't tell him about his strength or conditioning. Don't tell him about any kind of tactics. Don't tell him any anything that he won't care about. Firstly, he needs to just understand, to love to play football. That is under eight. From 8 to 12, you improve his technical ability. You tell him about the touch. You tell him about a few things that he needs to understand. So, Wenger went on to talk about the development of young players. And I don't know if there are coaches in India, if there are people in India who are working like this at the development of the players. We just want to have success and it cannot happen. I have, I have been telling uh, this to a lot of people who have been watching our content that they want India to have success right now. I recently posted a video about the people, the, the players selected for the national team for this upcoming uh, games. Everyone want, everyone said, why the same team? So there are why people the who, who do not understand that you can't go on and change the core of a team in every competition. You can't have, okay, 626 player didn't work in this game. Let's have different sets of players. It doesn't go like that. You need to have a, a solid core and then you need to give the chance to the players who deserve it. But everything starts from the ground root, the foundation. If the kid, if my kid at eight doesn't know what football is, if he doesn't know the rules, he's not going to become a footballer at 18. It's very important that the that the young people, that the kids get the right conditioning. And it's not but happening. Can the I, vision can I 2047. Uh, can I stop you yes, there yes, for a second? The, You're talking about eight-year-olds right now. And Mr. Bajaj and I will know that also, Jeremy, of having worked in India. Yeah. But an eight-year-old, where is he going to learn it except at Minerva, Schools. at United Sports Club, at Bangalore, at Goa? Mr. Bajaj, tell me if I'm forgetting a club, but I think it's about it. Three, that's, four, five clubs that's all. who are having underage 
and all the rest, there is nothing. Last mm -hmm. year, 2023, there was a calendar made up by AIFF where yeah. there was a three month under 13 league, three month under 15 league, three month under 17 league, and next year, 2024, it's nine months. Sorry, but we are in 2024 <laughs> already. My under 13s have played exactly five matches. My under 15s, we were the first team in AIFF, the first team who had registered our 30 players, and still we have played zero matches. Our under 17s, we were the first team in AIFF who had registered. Maybe, but Mr. Bajaj, I'm not yeah. sure. Maybe you were no, the first. One team. Steve, but no, no, I no. Think... Steve, I'll tell you, even worse mm -hmm. than that, it's, it's not even this year. So I keep on saying, you know, we are very great because we won all the titles together. We won the under 13, 15, 18 in one year. Do you know we still hold those titles? And I won them in 2018, 19. That means I have not won titles every year. I hold those titles because for the last six years, there has been no youth league. Yeah. What development? So whatever we are doing is just by luck. That's okay? it. Not because That's of it. any planning. There has been no youth league for the last six years. That means not we have lost one generation. We have lost six generations of players. What does that mean? Each of those players have gone and played a game like cricket and got stuck yeah. there or hockey or whatever is available. They're not going to wait for football to restart. Yeah, exactly. And this is indeed where the problem lies that all those players, all the talks that we are doing, next month, uh, next year, 2024, there is supposed to be Nine months youth league. It's written in the AIFF calendar. We are still busy with the 2023 leagues. My under 17s, <laughs> because of what happened with East Bengal, I think everyone knows there has oh, yeah. been a process gone against East Bengal because of age cheating. Until yeah. today, until today, our club still doesn't know if we are playing in the final round or not because. There is no one who can tell us. Now, I've heard unofficially that on 29th of March, it starts in Goa, the final round of under-17. But we don't know if we're playing. We have no idea. So, <laughs> so our team has played seven matches, the full seven matches. I see Peter laughing. But, but yeah. this is the reality. <laughs> Peter, this is Peter the reality. imagine you can, you know, imagine you can just switch off and uh, your webcam when this is over. Steve <laughs> still has a home to go to, to a different country, which has been world number one for fucking how many years. We have to actually live through this shit, okay? Yeah. And we are so helpless. You don't know how desperate and helpless we are because football is not rocket science. Because if it was rocket science, it would only be the ultra-rich countries getting through. We've got countries from having war-torn countries like yeah. Palestine who are able to do better than us. See, no disrespect to them, but it's just that, imagine there is not what we are doing right. But I think all the discussion should be what we are doing wrong. Because I think everything which can go wrong is going wrong. There is no federation head. There is no leadership. There is no uh, support from the government. No support from the corporates. No support from the culture of fans. So, we, it's the uphill battle. Then with this, with the fixing which comes in and then you come in with all the kind of other age fraud problems you have. So we've got to get a house in order and a house in order doesn't mean, unfortunately, Zisha, and I know it would, that somehow we're able to fix our senior team. Our senior team will not be fixed uh, until and unless our juniors are fixed. That means Absolutely. we should forget about the senior team. I know it hurts. But Ranjit sir, but that you and I know. See, you and I know. Yeah, but we, we are what? Like a drop. Because then we'll just be disappointed. Yeah. We are hoping for miracles from our boys. Exactly. We are putting undue pressure on my Indian boys e to exactly. do so well against teams who have gone and brought up, brought up from football. So, like, whatever pass, for example, my uh, Sunil Chetri has made, my boys playing for Jordan have made 10,000 times at the age yeah, exactly. of 22. And Sunil Chetri has done it at the age of 40. So, the number of hours has already been put in by him by yes. the age of 21. That's what you and I know, Ranjit, sir. Because, but, but the general yeah. people in India, they 
they want to get at our tails and they're gonna ask where is the success there are people who comment and ask why should we support you if you can't make us happy and there have been people who who blatantly come and say that no we're not gonna watch indian football i'm like okay we don't care about you people we want to only care about the people who care about the development of indian football who have patience for me i i probably i haven't worked in youth development and coaching there are people who know better than me i believe the under 20 and the 23 teams are one of the most important fi fixtures in any in any uh, country's growth in football in any because developed that's country's where growth. bro any yeah. developed country's growth under 23 is very important why exactly. because that is going to be your next senior team okay exactly. but in a underdeveloped country's growth the most important team in your country is your under 12 under 13 team you need to have a national team under 13. Did we have one 10 years no. ago? Yes, we did. Himan no, we did. We had Himanshu Jangra who was in the under 13 team. Why? Because there was some Asian tournament which happened and they had to collect a team. Yeah. And then the team is made one month before and disbanded after that. Now, if those same boys had been kept for the last five years, imagine what kind of a batch you would have. Four of them have raced in the ISL. Yeah. But imagine if you had put a pressure on, I mean, thing, and they would have not been in the ISL, probably been playing in Europe. So we need to actually now stop talking about development and force our force our federation. We have the power to force them. To we have a FIFA Academy opening open, yeah. lying in wait. We have coaches from FIFA who are saying, please send us the under fourteen boys so we can prepare them for the under sixteen AFC Cup. FIFA is paying for it. These guys can't even scout hundred boys from all over India and put them. They put fifty sent fifty boys. All of them were sent home because. They were not scouted. They were just sent because he's my son or he's my auntie's son or he's my uncle's son. <laughs> Where's this? Where's this academy? Where's this FIFA? It's, it's, FIFA it's in Bhubaneswar. Bhubaneswar. So Bhubaneswar, Rudisha, they have sponsored the entire stadium and the academy. FIFA has sponsored the coaches. FIFA yeah, sponsored so, the coaches. So there's nothing so the Federation has to do except just give them the boys. They can't so, even Mr. Ba so, Mr. Bajaj, we were, we were so lucky to be in the same under-17 group as yep. Sports Odisha, they yes. were in our group, fully, yes. fully funded by the state government of Odisha and who lost two times against the club who doesn't have any funding, Sports Odisha and Odisha FC lost two times with the under-17. And, and to us, and to us yes. as well, exactly. So, so this is what I mean and what you are saying exactly right. There is so much money going around but they have not the knowledge in how to do it. We can talk about success with the senior team. That will not happen as long as the junior teams are not doing what they need to do and that we can help them how it should be done by the talks that we are having here with all these people together. And I'm sure that Peter, who has been laughing a couple of times when he heard, in 2000, when Belgium and the Netherlands organized the Euros. We were the first yes. country, because it's easy to say, Mr. Bajaj, we were number one in the world, but we were the first country ever organizing a Euro being kicked out in the group stage. The Netherlands went to the semi-final or the final. The Netherlands, who are our neighbors, were laughing with us. And for 12 yes. years, we didn't qualify. Right, Peter? We didn't yeah, qualify right. for 12 years. We were number 79 on the world, on the FIFA ranking, but we changed our youth development. And we yes. took our time. We took our time to go and look in the Netherlands, how the Netherlands was doing it, to go and look in Spain, how Spain was doing it. And then we made our own identity. And from that identity came Eden Hazard, Kevin De Bruyne, Romelu Lukaku, Vincent Company, because Vincent Company was the first one. By the way, he Steve, was the first one. people don't know. So let me just give a little background mm -hmm. to this. And this is what I keep quoting. Belgium did it because they made coaching education so accessible to everyone. They made it so cheap that because education is supposed to be your right and it's supposed to be cheap. They have more coaching. Uh, they have more coaches in Belgium or even in Japan, goalkeeping coaches in Belgium than India has total number of A, B, C, D plus pro license coaches. Wow. If we don't have coaches, forget about youth development, who's going to teach them. So they started at building their foundation. Once they had good UEFA B license coaches and even a school teacher was a UEFA B license coach. So even in your school education, 
Kevin D. Bryans and Hazards were learning from gym teachers who were teaching them the right basics. So correct me if I'm wrong. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, and that's happened indeed in the countries. If it was Finland, Denmark, same thing. Denmark has done so wonderfully well. Um, by the way that they've put the, the uh, structure in, in pro licensing, in the coaching licensing. And this is what I'm what I was talking about, that the B license is being done on my training pitches right now. And I can follow it day in, day out. And it is, and you know this well enough. I see you looking down. Um, it is it is a disaster to look at. And it's, it is not it's, good it's enough. A joke. It's yes, a joke. it is not good enough, sadly enough, to push your coaches because that's what needs to be done. When yeah. I did my UEFA B license, I did my Belgium A license. It was tough. It was tough to get my license. It was not easy. I did not know in advance that I was going to get it, and Here I'm is sure the that box, that's Steve, it. everyone knows they're going to get it before they even enter the course. So who studies? Does they don't do anything? So the same habits are carried forward when they're actually coaching. So they think they're making these coaching diagrams and session plans is only for licenses. I've never seen them ever do it outside. So you know what I'm talking about. We can just go on. Right. So after like, it's already around two hours of this amazing discussion. We have stated so many problems and you know how we can proceed ahead with the solutions. So like the last time we had done it in the group discussion, we'd like to do it this time as well. So before we leave, we would like to leave a message for Indian football governing body, which is AIFF. So starting with Ranjit, sir, because he has to leave the next day early morning. Sir, I'm leaving give... at 5 a.m. for my under-13 I-League, my first match there. So um, okay. I always try. I, I have an I-League match, so I'm missing that because I, I love watching the young boys play. <laughs> okay. So the, okay, the message which I want to give AIFF is that I know that your elections happen after every two, three years. And I know maybe the work you do right now will maybe help the president, which is going to be there after two terms. But you know, think of not helping the president. You're going to be helping our country. You'll be the one responsible for making sure India qualifies the World Cup after 12 years. But that only happens if we have strong leadership and we make sure that these academies of the under-14 excellence academies are given to the right people. That means people like Steve Herbertson, United, because they have already done it. They've proven it. Us, people who have given results, or Bengaluru FC, where you know they get the right facilities and they're focused on the right thing. Imagine if we have five centers like this, whose only job is to produce players and not be entering in competitions. I'm willing to do it. So is Nababda. We don't want to enter under 13, 15 I League as long as our only job is to produce internationals for India. Give us the opportunity to help India because we can't do it alone. Me sitting here, Nababda sitting there, another one sitting the other side. Okay. Dishan Bhai, if you would like to take next on this. I, I would just say that uh, I think uh, we have formed a good plan. Uh, 2027, the, the vision uh, looks good on paper. But uh, like we were talking about the development of players, uh, we talk about India is a country of 1.5 billion people and we can't find 11 players. I believe that everything would start off by if we, if we try to train the young kids. It starts from school. In uh, in our days, a lot of people would have faced this. The PE classes, the physical education classes were often given for, okay, maths, physics, science. Let's not do that. Let's, let's try to put uh, some kind of... Uh, uh, sports culture in our schools as well, in all the governmental schools, the private schools. Let let the kids be connected to football. It has to come through the government. We can't inflict that. So they would be the ones who would be inflicting this. So it's just a request that uh, the schools pay attention to it uh, because it's a big country. We can't pay attention to every possible city. But I believe that there are players, I have seen players who are very, very good and they need the best possible treatments. And lastly, the development of the coaches, the ease, the access, the infrastructures and stuff like that. We need that to, we need that yesterday. So that is going to be the simple one word message. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So Peter, sir, you are laughing in the backstage when there were a lot of problems and being discussed. Oof. So I think, I think you've got a good understanding. Please go ahead with whatever you have understood about Indian football. I believe you are not totally deeply into Indian football, but for whatever you have understand from today's conversation, what is that message? I, that you... 
give to the governing if, body? If I hear everything, uh, everything starts, uh, and I think uh, you can see it the most easy way is that uh, it's totally right. If you don't start playing football in schools and on the street and everywhere, and you don't start from the uh, from the ground to build a house, and you start uh, on the rooftop, then you never will be successful. And there's, I think um, you have to stick together. Everybody has to have one aim. And I think that has to be from the politic way and from the pre new president of the Indian Football Federation that he has to have one plan and follow the plan and stick to the plan and take people, good people with him to build something. Otherwise, you will never be successful. And I think um, this is my advice. And more I cannot say because I'm not so much into Indian football. But if I hear this, um, yeah, all of this, I think um, the future of Indian football has to change dramatically. And at starting, I think, with uh, the high people up, that they understand uh, that, uh, yeah, that if you want to reach something, you have to work for it. And, and that's the only way. Okay. Okay. Tony, sir, if you would like to go ahead on this. Uh, well, yeah, it's been very interesting <laughs> to to listen to you guys. Uh, well, I, I don't really have any that much to add what being said. Of course, you need you need the willingness to to change things. You need right people to understand what uh, what it means to to get uh, success. It doesn't come in a one day. It doesn't. You can't buy it. Uh, the money is important, but you can't buy it. You have to implement right things and uh, of course you guys know a lot better the, what's what's possible in india but i think uh, the potential is uh, amazing but you have to you have to find the best practices you have to what what suits your uh, parts of the country they can be different and you have to have, have the best practices you have to stick to them you have to be patient uh, and uh, you have to have the understanding, like what's been said about uh, building a house. It's the same about building the the system, the organization. The and then it comes to the you have to co you have to educate the coaches. That's that's very very important. That uh, because they are in so much you know, responsible of the then helping the players to 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 come better. So I think uh, a lot of good, good things were said here, but. Uh, you have to get organized. That's that's the thing. And uh, then, uh, but uh, if there is enough right people, good people who understand the the big picture, you have to uh, you have to see the big picture. It's it's of course it's possible. The country is amazing. Like we said, Jeremy and everybody here, that's so much potential that I just hope that you can find the best uh, practice and uh, whenever. Uh, I, I I was very pleased to get, be invited here and uh, share my ideas as well. But yeah, good luck for you, uh, for you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Jeremy, sir, if you would like to take on this about the message part. I mean, I, I just wish some of these guys got a chance to experience what's going on in India because I'm not going to say it's the last great frontier, but... Uh, it's pretty amazing and, and, there, and there has to be an understanding that um at every day that things continue you're far you're falling farther behind the rest of the world that things are going at a fast rate um but but at the end of the day you need educated committed and i think most importantly egoless leaders who are kind of take the approach that they're servant leaders um Sure, the, the 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 youth development is key, but there's certain things that you need to solve right away, and that's competitive domestic matches and uh, exposure, international exposure by coaches and players, and, and there just has to be a commitment. I, I really, on one level, it's not that difficult, but but it's it's organization, it's it's investment and uh detailed planning and and I, I think just by you know hearing tony and peter i mean i mean they've done it they're they're from smaller countries they don't have there's not a lot of wiggle room they've been incredibly efficient and uh india just needs to 
follow that path a little bit more. Okay. Steve, sir, if you would like to conclude this conversation. Well, I think that most people who have been here have, have told a lot of sense in what needs to happen um, in Indian football. And I'm convinced about that also. And I think one of the main things that Mr. Bajaj said at the end in his talk was there are indeed some people here who are fighting on a daily basis to change Indian football. And with the investments that are being done now, with the money that is being spent now, if it is true state government, if it is true FIFA, if it is true AIFF, I personally think also that it should be going direction to people who have been fighting daily already, because those are the ones that actually want to make a change in this football. And I think, indeed, the four or five names that Mr. Bajaj just said, if it is United Sports Club, if it is Bangalore, if it is Minerva, if it is Sporting Club, the Goa or Goa FC, there are quite a few who are trying daily their best. But if they can get the resources, if they can get the opportunities to actually put bigger things in, in motion, then I think you have your five, six centers already, but they are missing the financial background to really make a change here. And Indian football needs it from top to bottom and from bottom to top to make that difference. And if all these centers, all these people that I talk to within this uh, podcast, that they sit together and they have a certain philosophy and vision with a planning, with a periodization, as everything that we've told here, they can work together, then I think that there is something possible in Indian football. Like okay. Being a social content creator, Zishan Bhai also knows that, you know, we are influencing the youth. We are taking, you know, the reality of football in front of the youth. We are telling them that what the AIFF is doing and what the Igor Stamit or the national team is doing. By like, you know, after this conversation, we like, I personally realized many of many things that yes, the AIFF needs a proper model 2047 more of a paper model. But yes, we need like the, there's too much talking, nothing like an action. We really need that. And thank you so much, Tony, sir, Rido, sir, and everybody else over here that they, you know, like you guys tells us the main things that right, which are really required to build the youth football. So me and Sagar, like being the host and the co-host also, we will take your message forward to, we would like to take the message forward with Zishan Bhai and Ranjit sir towards the IFF. And we would like to, you know, uh, you know, make a big impact in front of the youth that what the international coaches, the scouts uh, really need to say and what they really feel like the Peters are really laughed about the condition of Indian football. So what they really feel and how, like, then we see that if, you know, AIF will like do something or not, not we don't know. But yes, we will continue, you know, to put our efforts into this. And thank you so much, guys, for you know coming on the podcast. We are really pleasure to have you guys. Thank you so much.